Romantic as the notion might seem, the music we listen to today is not the ultimate product of the desire of agrarian societies in a downtrodden industrial proletariat to perpetuate folk memories in communal song for common people to rally around, sing to, dance to, drink to, fight to, chase a mate to, while the gilded classes enjoy unchanging and hidebound classical forms that entail separate and inviolately conservative rituals. Well, Maybe it was for your great-great-grandfather, but not for us. For us, music is the project shaped by market demands directed by business values and rendered by industrial processes. Markets, businesses and the means of production is based largely in cities. And after that mid-1920s, as recording companies began to entrench themselves in these cities, rather than go to the talent, they found the talent more than willing to come to them. Certain cities began to develop unique musical personalities based on the markets they serviced and the musicians they attracted. Others became more broadly serviceable. Here's a look at the cities which, in the opinion of your humble narrator, have left the greatest and most distinctive legacy on the music of the classic canon. In the UK, all roads tend to lead, musically at least, to London. But a couple have cities that have bucked the trend in a significant way, most notably Manchester and Sheffield. Indeed, few cities have had its recent history painted by its musical culture in the last 50 years as vividly as Sheffield. The difference between Manchester and Sheffield scenes is neatly summed up by a little metaphor, inasmuch as Manchester was dominated by factory records, donating volume and uniformity of brand, whereas Sheffield's post-punk bands set up in the abundant, abandoned little Mester workshops, the salons where master cutlers once plied their highly individual trade. The first, and in some ways still the most influential band on the Sheffield scene was Cabaret Voltaire, an Eno kraut rock influenced trio whose music evolved to more commercial forms and ultimately became hugely influential in the house music scene from the mid-80s on, but they began as a trio of art rock neo-terrorists. The Human League, Def Leppard, ABC and the Arctic Monkeys all went on to huge chart and critical success, while Pulp overcame a decade of uncertainty and ambivalence to become the sceptical voice at the back of Britpop's sunny, world-engulfing optimism. Of course, the Sheffield scene was also borne mightily on the back of its doyen artists, for example Joe Cocker and Tony Christie. Australia is behind the US Japan, Germany, Britain and France, the sixth biggest music market in the world. Which is impressive seeing we're 55th in terms of population. We've also since 1958 had a largely self-sufficient music industry based around four major markets. Melbourne, which developed the more forward-looking music scene. Brisbane, which gave the scene Ray Brown and the Whispers, the legendary Billy Thorpe, and sent the Bee Gees to their finishing school in Sydney. And then in the 70s and 80s developed what is called the Striped Sunlight Sound, a pop, punk, more melodic style. My theory is that that evolved out of there being so few decent drummers on the scene, although this theory is almost immediately discounted by the fact that the band I played in was certainly a striped sunlight band and we had two very good drummers and Perth Perth is weird Perth bands are weird but of all of the centers of Australian music the timeline of the industry can be best told by the story of the music of Sydney all built around that city's distinctive mix of grime and glamour from legendary studios such as Albert Trafalgar and Paradise down to the brutal pub rock culture the Sydney sound was always the voice of bored working class youth struggling to retain their identities and totems and the band on the romantic fringes of that culture that reached out to it rather than lean away from it the way the more elitist Melbourne scene did. Brazilian music is dazzlingly diverse and has an almost total disregard for genre and the boundaries between them. It stems largely but wholly from four musical super cities, any one of which could have made this list. 
Salvador with its own sizzling Afro-Brazilian style, Sao Paulo, home of the Tropicalismo Collective, a group of genre-blending musicians who constantly invoke the ire of the military junta that ran Brazil from 1964 to 1985, Belo Horizonte, which was so nearly selected for the list, which was also the home of the collective, the Corner Club, led by Milton Nascimento, which was not only a stone in the shoe of the government, but was widely influential outside Brazil and made international superstars of many of its members. Nowadays, Sepultura fly the flag for BH in their evolving metal style. And at the centre of it all lies Rio de Janeiro. Most famous as the home for Bossa Nova, Rio is also the major focus of Brazilian jazz. Stan Getz's album with Astrid Gilberto was the first jazz album to win a Grammy. Choro, the Brazilian form of the blues. Samba, which came originally from Salvador, the brash and percussive samba was adopted as the music of the poor people of Brazil, while the quieter, more thoughtful Bossa Nova was the music of the middle class and the intellectuals. All of this along with the funk of Bahian immigrants and the politically oriented singer-songwriters who came up from Sao Paulo and Belo Horizonte helped build a truly national character for Brazilian music based around the scene in Rio de Janeiro. While Paris may well have had a claim to being the centre of European popular music for longer and having made its fair share of great records, the sheer volume and variety of brilliance pumped out of Musicland Studios, which were until 1972 a dingy basement of the uber-modern Sheraton Hotel, and which was, in the 1970s, the only major recording studio between Paris and Tokyo, makes Munich's case emphatically. Before Musicland, Popol Vuh, Faust, Armandul II, Guru Guru and Umbrio had, had all made seminal kraut rock records in Munich. Due in no small part to genius engineer Reinhold Mack, Musicland was particularly favoured by British groups. Queen were mainstays there, the Rolling Stones did two albums there, Deep Purple and Rainbow were frequent denizens, as well as ELO, along with Giorgio Moroder's stable of Euro disco stars, no, no shock there, he owned the studio. Uh, Led Zeppelin recorded Presence there, David Bowie produced The Idiot for Iggy Pop with a full measure of Teutonic coldness, Billy Squire cut his magnum opus to stroke there. The demise of Musicland was unusual, it had to close down in the late 90s because vibrations from a nearby new underground line started to interfere with the recording equipment. Memphis was a major city for American R&B, blues and soul 40 years before Elvis Presley came onto the scene and for another 20 years after. As the first major port upriver from New Orleans and only 20 miles north of Tunica, the northernmost largish town in the fabled Mississippi Delta, Memphis was always a major market for blues and jazz musicians to seek out. W.C. Handy, the first major figure in what we understand as the blues, based himself in town. The first ever blues hit record was his 1915 The Memphis Blues, irrevocably tying the city to the music. In the late 20s and early 30s, the city became famous for its hokum style of blues. After World War II, some of the first great electric bluesmen appeared. Howlin' Wolf, B.B. King, Ike Turner. The 50s saw a stable of sun stars. In 1957, Satellite Records, a country and rockabilly label, set up business. They changed to R&B when signing Rufus Thomas and, by 1961, to Stax Records, who, at their peak, had a peerless stable of soul musicians. Stax's local rivals were High Records, the tight and propulsive till Stax's loose and funky with Al Green, and Peebles, O.V. Wright and Otis Clay. Memphis is inseparable from the history of the entire gamut of African-American music and the crucial points where it merged with the Anglo-Scottish tradition of hill music. Chicago holds its rank for both its historical importance and for the sheer volume of talent that emerged from the city and the suburbs. It is pivotal in the history of jazz, both as the first point of migration for many classic New Orleans acts. Chicago held sway over New York for much of the 20s as the capital city of jazz, as well as local talent such as Maxwell Street native Benny Goodman. From the late 1920s, musicians from the Delta and Memphis came north, seeking bigger audiences, paychecks and record deals. 
Big Bill Brunsey was the doyen of local bluesmen in the 30s, 40s and early 50s, while Muddy Waters and Magic Sam came out of the Delta, Buddy Guy from Baton Rouge and Howlin' Wolf, already a big star, boasted how he drove himself down from Memphis in his own Cadillac with $4,000 in his pocket. The embodiment of New Orleans R&B himself, champion Jack Dupree, in fact did most of his work in Chicago. Elmore James had a cluster of big hits out of the town before dying of a heart attack in 1963. Etta James spent 16 years on chess, making great records. Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley brought the rocking consciousness to the 50s and the staple singers brought socially hip gospel to the forefront in the mid 50s to the mid 70s. Sam Cooke began his career as a gospel singer there. Super bands like Chicago, Cheap Trick, admittedly from Rockford, but close enough, Earth, Wind and Fire, Wilco and the Smashing Pumpkins kept the hits coming through the 1970s into the 1990s. House music emerged from the local club scene in the mid 80s before one of the most diverse hip hop scenes in the world took over, spearheaded by narcissistic mentalist Kanye West and the late Great Juice World. Los Angeles is a difficult city to place given its musical culture is based largely on Emma Gray's. The LA recording scene is an offshoot of course of the movie business. Capitol Records was founded there in 1942 as the first West Coast based record label and was leader in the field of pop music and then went nuclear in the 1960s with rock and roll as they were the Beatles US record label as well as the Beach Boys. The record business took a big step forward towards becoming an independent industry during World War II as huge numbers of country music's core market moved west to find war work. A West Coast jazz style headed up by the likes of Stan Getz and Chet Baker emerged in the early 50s. Blues and R&B and early rock and roll were catered for by independents such as Imperial and Specialty and great records came both from transplanted acts and from a wave of new bands either made up of local kids like the Beach Boys or individuals who came looking for a shot at the big time, uh, for example the Eagles. But the myth of Los Angeles and a sun and shadow dapple music of the canyons or the hall of endless summer persists. Even as the cutting edge Kendrick Lamar and Draco the Ruler continue LA hip hop's explorations into the dark heart of the city of angels. Still in the USA and Nashville wasn't always the epicenter of country music. Previously towns like Bristol, Virginia or Bristol, Tennessee depending on which side of the street you were standing on, Camden, New Jersey, New York City, Dallas and especially Cincinnati were major country music towns. Nashville's first musical milestone was at Fisk University where the Jubilee style of gospel singing first developed. The first recording studio was set up in the Tulane Hotel on Polk Avenue and it didn't arrive until 1947. Before that, acts had recorded in the radio studios of WSM, the station which broadcasts the Grand Ole Opry. Indeed, it wasn't until 1956 when three events shaped the destiny of Nashville. The death of a chap called Jim Beck, who owned recording studios in Dallas, put dozens of hotshot musicians out of work. Decker and RCA set up offices with Owen Bradley and Chet Atkins as local heads. And the brilliant idea of the president of the Nashville Locals Musicians Union, George Cooper, who removed the provisions that musicians had to be able to read and write music which led to that flood of hot pickers coming into town. Meanwhile, the legacy of Hank Williams inspired a generation of great upcoming songwriters. By 1962, all of the majors had state-of-the-art studios in the city. Rock musicians, starting with Bob Dylan, started to come down and make records from the mid-1960s and cut some classics. But ultimately, country music in Nashville have become and remain synonymous for one another. Long-time headquarters for the British publishing, distribution and recording industries, London is imperative on this list for the sheer volume and quality of the product it's created and for a long time its ability to forge a distinctive British musical identity. While London is most notably associated with Abbey Road Studio and Abbey Road with the Beatles, there were many legendary studios where many legendary records were made. There's SARM West, I'm not sure if that's an acronym or 
or the word psalm, where Bob Marley cut Exodus and Band-Aid did Do They Know It's Christmas, Trident Studios, where T-Rex did Electric Warrior and David Bowie made Ziggy Stardust, RGM Sounds, where Joe Meek made music from another planet, there was Britannia Row, which was set up by Pink Floyd to record Animals in 1977, and Joy Division went on to make their highly influential Closer album. Wessex Sound, where Nevermind the Bollocks hears the Sex Pistols and the Clashes of London calling my labour over. Olympic Studios was much loved by the Rolling Stones, and where Jimi Hendrix conjured up most of Are You Experienced. R.A.K. Studio, whose raucous roster included the likes of Susie Quattro, Mud, Hot Chocolate, Kim Wilde, and the rather less raucous The Cure and Adele. And finally, Mark Knopfler's British Grove Studios, where the Rolling Stones made their first UK studio recordings in 48 years in 2016. London has diminished somewhat as a world music centre as the UK loses traction as a centre of world musical culture, but its legacy both as a creative centre and a focus for popular culture during the gilded era of rock music ensures its place on the list. No city in a major music production market so dominated that market as did Kingston, Jamaica in its 1960s heyday. It is difficult to think of a market of around 450,000 people serviced so competitively as Kingston from 1958 to 1973. It's hard to imagine a market that small. And remember, local product was competing with import, while the US market basically ignored JA music, and it only started to make a small indent in the UK from 1968 on or so, with the rest of the world only really getting into it into the late 1970s. It's hard to conceive that in the era of the super producer, seven of the greatest record makers of all time, Coxone Dodd, Duke Reed, Joe Gibbs, Sonia Pottinger, Leslie Kong, Prince Buster and Lee Perry, each unique to one another, all worked in studios in within a mile and a half radius. No city has ever had such a linear and dynamic scene as Kingston. There was no evolution of styles. The new thing emerged and the old thing disappeared. From mento and light jazz to JARB to ska to rocksteady to reggae. The golden age of Kingston saw them rise, vanish and leave only some wonderful records and the memory of some amazing artists. Much like Kingston, the music of New Orleans is so tightly woven into the character of the city, into its vibe, into its history, into its self-identification, that it becomes hard to tell the music from the city and the city from the music. And it must be said few, if any, cities have had made as deep a contribution to Western popular music. From the African dancers in the Congo Square to Buddy Bolden and Jelly Roll Morton to King Ola in Storytown and Louis Armstrong on his Arabas wagon through Dave Bartholomew and Fats Domino, Stick McGee, Little Richard, Eddie Bow, Earl King, Ernie K. Doe, Lee Dorsey, Dr. John, the Nevilles and the Meters up to the new heroes of jazz like Trombone Shorty, one of the best live acts I have ever seen. It's not always how many great records are made in the city because a lot of New Orleans acts best records were actually made in Chicago. Sometimes it is like Chicago or Liverpool, it's history and the musical culture that can be imparted through records inspired by that city that makes the real story. At the beginning of the exercise, I juggled the top three around for a few days, but eventually it became blindingly obvious on every basis we judge music on. New York City is the greatest musical city in the world. Chicago may have ruled the 20s and LA and London the 60s, but it's New York that clutches the imagination of anyone with an interest in the history of these things. The key players of every musical form either rose from or made their way to the huge marketplace that New York City represented. The blues were first recorded here at OK on 7th Avenue. Fiddle and John Carson made the first hillbilly records here in 1923. Charlie Poole invented country music with his Columbia session of 1925. 
During World War II, the New York developed style of bebop sounded the death knell of big band jazz. Atlantic Records took R&B nationwide out of New York City. While rock and roll arose more in the second cities, Bill Haley and his Comets did cut rock around the clock on West 70th Street in 1954. As the hotspots for emerging rock music moved to LA and London in the 1960s and R&B and country music headed southward, New York remained the world capital for jazz before an emerging local scene of bands like The Ramones, Television, Richard Hell, Blondie and Talking Heads. Bands all informed in some way by not only their experiences in New York City, but particularly the Ramones and Blondie, by the legends of the city. Shortly after those bands broke out, hip-hop, which had originated in the Bronx but gained its foothold in the industry in New Jersey, recrossed the river and started its rise to becoming the most commercially dominant music form ever. Make of it what you will, but since music making became an industrialised product a hundred years ago, the musicians have come to New York. The contracts have been signed in New York. The music has been made in New York and the music has been shaped by New York. There are many, many great cities in the world that have given us the music we know and love. Some on this list, some I may have neglected to add to this list, but none has given us the impact and the influence of New York City.